Thank you for joining us today on Synthesis Workshop. On today's Research Spotlight episode, I'm very happy to have with us Dr. Philip Grant to take us through his recently completed total synthesis of Leonu Kitel. Phil did his undergraduate as well as his doctoral studies at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. His doctoral supervisors were Professor Margaret Brimble and Dr. Daniel Furkert, and he also spent some time as a visiting student in the Agarwal Group at the University of Bristol. Currently, Phil is a Lisa Meitner postdoctoral fellow in the Malid Group in the University of Vienna. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Phil. Thank you very much for being here today to share your work with us. Thank you, Matthew, for that kind introduction. And thanks also for giving me this opportunity to present my research on what is a very cool platform that you've got going. I'll be presenting my total synthesis of Leonuketal, which is a molecule that I worked on during my PhD in um, the labs of Professor Margaret Brimble at Auckland University. Leonuketal is a Seiko Lab Day natural product isolated from Chinese liverwort in 2015. It displayed some interesting vasorelaxin activity, but what really drew us to pursue a total synthesis of Leonuketal was indeed the structure itself. The structure of Leonu Ketel contains a tetracyclic spiroketal core with several stereocenters in a densely packed arrangement. A structure like this poses many challenges to the synthetic chemist and serves as an excellent platform to test existing methods and to develop new ones. Our retrosynthetic analysis was targeted towards this late stage intermediate, which represents a simplified analogue of the spirocyclic core structure. We recognized that a gold-catalyzed spiroketalization reaction could provide us with access to this core structure. And that led us back to this functionalized alkyne. Disconnection of this alkyne into two major fragments by an alkylation reaction leads us to this iodide as well as a known beta-keto ester. At the outset of the study, we imagine a few possible ways to access the core cyclohexanol ring of this iodide, and ultimately, we found that a titanosine-mediated cyclization did the trick. Now, the first challenge in pulling off our retrosynthetic analysis in the forwards direction was to execute a titanosine-mediated cyclization to assemble the cyclohexanol ring colored here in red. Initially, we investigated a cascade reaction involving the cyclization of this epoxide. This cyclization was initiated by single electron reduction followed by intramolecular trapping of the resultant radical with a nitrile. Unfortunately, the yields for this reaction were too low to build a viable synthetic route on. So instead, we sought a more reliable transformation. We proposed that a completely intramolecular variant of the previous transformation may prove more reliable. So we investigated the cyclization of this epoxide where the nitrile radical acceptor is tethered via an ether linkage. While this transformation didn't have the highest yield, it was very reliable on scale and provided us with access to the core structure shown here in red. Now, to incorporate this intermediate into our total synthesis, we then needed uh, a way to strategically break open that second ring, and we also needed to epimerize the stereocenter at C7. The epimerization of C7 was achieved by an oxidation reduction sequence where l selectride a bulky hydride source, was found to be the key reagent in setting that alcohol in an axial configuration. With the C7 stereocenter set in the correct configuration, we needed an efficient way to break open that second ring. And for this purpose, we built on the venerable Shapiro reaction. Typically, the Shapiro reaction refers to the formation of vinyl lithium species upon deprotonation of a tosohydrazone. Generally, this vinyl lithium species would go on to be trapped with an electrophile. We found that formation of a vinyl lithium species from alkentone led to the spontaneous elimination to break open that second ring, as well as form our desired alkyne motif. The next challenge in our total synthesis would be the fragment coupling step. We were able to form this iodide without too much trouble, but the subsequent alkylation was a real challenge. We first investigated a few methods that would have allowed us to set the C10 and C11 stereocenters in the correct configuration during the alkylation step, but none of these were successful. Ultimately, we found that alkylation with this beta-keto ester worked well, 
but it left us with the challenge of setting the C10 and C11 stereo centers later on in the synthesis. Since the reduction of C11 would have likely given us a mixture of diastereomers, we opted to investigate the spiroketalization reaction on a substrate where C11 was in the ketone oxidation state. Generally, gold catalyzed spiroketalization reactions are performed on dihydroxy substrates. So we were in somewhat uncharted territory here. The benefit of performing the cyclization at this step would be to transform C10 and C11 into an alkene in the product, which we thought we may be able to reduce stereoselectively by hydrogenation later on in the synthesis. And this would solve our issue of the stereochemistry at C10 and C11. And in the event, we found that this substrate reliably gave us the coarse spiroketal upon treatment with gold chloride. So the next challenge was to stereoselectively hydrogenate the double bond at C10 and C11. We proposed that the spiroketal oxygen, coloured here in red, could direct addition of hydrogen to the back face of the molecule, thereby setting C10 and C11 in the correct configuration. Unfortunately, the only conditions that we identified to reliably reduce that double bond also led to the formation of this isomer. This isomer likely arises from the hydrogenation at the undesired phase, followed by isomerization of the spiroketal. While the lack of stereo control is less than desirable, the yield of this reaction was nearly quantitative, and we were able to obtain sufficient amounts of the desired diastereomer to continue on with our total synthesis. The next phase of our synthesis involved elaboration of the ketal lactone portion of the endoketal, which we were able to achieve by hydrolysis of the lactone oxidation with DMP, and subsequent treatment with ethanol and an acid catalyst. At this stage, we had assembled the complete core structure of the inuketal, and we were glad to be able to confirm that the structure of our intermediate matched that of the natural product by obtaining this crystal structure. Next, we were able to install the butanone side chain of the inuketal by application of some fairly straightforward Grignard chemistry, and upon doing so, we were just one oxygen atom away from completing the total synthesis. But of course, it wouldn't come easy. The first hit we got on forming that final carbon-oxygen bond was through treatment of our ketone with this camphosulfonyl oxyzeridine. Unfortunately, this reaction favoured the formation of the undesired epimer in a 9 to 1 diastereomeric ratio, which was much to our disappointment. To make matters worse, I got this result just a couple days before New Zealand went into full lockdown. So you can imagine my frustration at sitting at home and not being able to get back into the lab to revisit my final step. When I did make it back into the lab, it took quite a bit of experimenting to find a set of conditions that would achieve that final oxidation. I won't get into them, but if you're interested to get more detail, you can find them in the SI for the paper. Thankfully, I found that humble molecular oxygen was capable of performing the desired reaction, giving the natural product alongside its epimer in a one-to-one -one ratio. While a better selectivity for this step would have been desirable, it was certainly an improvement on the nine-to-one DR in favor of the wrong epimer, and we were really, really chuffed to have the natural product in our hands finally. So to summarize, the goal of synthesizing the Unuketel has helped us identify many limitations in the current synthetic methods. For some of these, we have found improvements, while others still remain a challenge. I'd like to thank Professor Margaret Brimble and Dr. Daniel Furkett for supervising me during my PhD, and for the rest of the Brimble group for being such a great bunch to do my PhD with. And lastly, I'd like to thank Matthew for inviting me on this video podcast, and I'd like to thank all of you for listening. Thank you for tuning in for another Research Spotlight episode, and thank you to Phil for a really interesting Total Synthesis talk. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out to us. To support this initiative, help us out by telling your peers about this resource. Check our webpage, synthesis-workshop.com, or follow us on Twitter to stay up to date. See you all next time!